Well, today let's look at Capella, the goat star, a very prominent star visible from where I am in Cambridge in the UK, and we'll see why. Here it is in the constellation of Auriga. It's the brightest star in, in Auriga, so it's designated alpha, with a magnitude of essentially zero, uh, 0.08 if you want to be precise, makes it one of the brightest stars in the northern part of the sky very much has a yellow color when you look at it. And it has this characteristic that you can always see it from anywhere, uh, any time of year in the uh, location where I live, anywhere around 52 degrees north. It's uh, what we call a circumpolar star. And it's for that reason that the Cambridge Astronomical Association chose it for the name for its uh, magazine. But Circumpolar stars are those that are near enough the pole that as the sky rotates, they never dip below the horizon from your viewing location. And so I've drawn the celestial sphere here and you've got the constellations that live within the blue hatched area. Those are the area where the rotation of the sky is never going to carry the star below the horizon. It'll go up over your head and then might dip down towards the north, but it won't quite disappear. And a question that I often set for my students on this one is to be able to calculate this sort of thing. And I insist they draw this diagram, which is uh, the side view of an observing location. You have the zenith straight up. You have the celestial equator and the north celestial pole, CE and NCP, at right angles to each other, obviously, and tipped back according to your latitude. If you were at the North Pole, the NCP would be directly above your head. Um, but the further south you go, the more it lowers towards the northern horizon. So from where I am, 52 degrees north, it's 52 degrees from the horizon to the line to the NCP. Um, and that's equal to my latitude, and that's marked on the diagram. And so then what I've done is marked the possible range of positions for Capella, depending on where it is in its rotation around the pole as the sky seems to spin. And it can be anywhere from just up overhead there to quite low in the north. And the angle from the NCP is going to be 90 minus the deck angle, the declination. And the declination is the angle between the line to the star and the celestial equator. So for Capella, that's 45.8 degrees from the CE line up to the first Capella line there. That's its declination, positive 45.8. And so with a little bit of trigonometry, we can work out that the minimum, uh, sorry, the maximum altitude for Capella where I've drawn the, the near vertical line, that's 83.8 .8 degrees, 90 minus 52, plus 45.8. You can work that out. The celestial equator is going to be 90 minus 52 above the horizon. And uh, then you add the 45.8 and you get to Capella. Now, 12 hours later, the sky will have spun round. Capella will be in its lower position. And so the offset from the north celestial pole downwards from the uh, 90 minus deck angle there. And you can work out that it ends up just 7.8 degrees above the horizon. Now, I know I haven't drawn it at 7.8 degrees, but I, I tried to draw these things so that they're easy to follow rather than being absolutely precise with the angles. Anyway, so what do we know about it? Well, 43 light years, roughly, the various different me methods of measuring it. Hipparchos, the satellite, came out with 42.8, and the modern orbital parallax method, 42.9. So pretty much 43. It was closer to us in the past. 237,000 years ago, it was just 27 light years from us, and it would have appeared very bright. It's pretty bright now, um, and the uh, closer it is, then by the inverse square law, you will be brighter and brighter as you approach something. You can see in the diagram the source of light, S, 
and at, at a distance r from it you're capturing one square meter of of the light but that light will be spread out over four square meters at two units of distance and over three square uh, uh, three it'll be nine so it's the inverse square as regards the intensity it turns out that this is at least a quadruple star system there are two yellow giant stars each around two and a half times the mass of the sun but quite highly evolved and on their way to being giants or even well into being giants they're only about 0.7 astronomical units apart. So they they orbit each other at about the distance that Venus orbits the sun. And it only takes 104 days to go round. That's uh, less than half the time that Venus takes. But of course, there's a lot more mass there involved in uh, creating the orbit. So you can follow Kepler's third law and it all makes sense. And then around the outside of the pair, there are two small red dwarfs h and l components there which are orbiting each other every 300 years um, in an orbit that goes about 10,000 astronomical units around the outside of the whole lot so it's uh, quite a complicated system and we believe that the age of this system is relatively young just 600 million years or so well that makes sense because if we look at the two giant stars, the yellow giants, the A star, we can measure the mass because we can see them orbiting and use Kepler's third law. We can get a very accurate measure of the mass, 2.569 solar masses, and B slightly smaller at 2.483. Uh, now, curiously, the temperatures, the A star is cooler, 4970, and the B star is slightly hotter, 5730, so 800 degrees or so hotter. Um, and that surprised me. But what's going on is that the A star is more highly evolved. It has more mass. And so although they were born together, it's made further progress around its life cycle than the B star has. So you can see this track on the right-hand side here. Uh, a bit of the Hertzsprung-Russell diagram for the Capella giants. And they would have left the main sequence as blue, hot, um, B-class or A-class stars, and then moved up, taken the hook, swung across the yellow uh, br branch there, the subgiant branch. And we think that the B star is still on the subgiant branch. It's not yet finished dumping helium into its core um, and is still burning the hydrogen around uh, the remains of it in the core, but mostly in the shell around it. The A star has got much further and has gone right up the red giant branch, up to the tip of the red giant branch, undergone the helium flash um, and triggered the beginnings of converting helium into carbon and oxygen and so it's then become hotter again more energy output because it's now using the core for fusion and so it's moved back down and round into the, the red clump although it's actually a, into the yellow colored region there just um, and it will evolve and head on up towards the asymptotic giant branch as it develops a large dead inert carbon oxygen core um, so it's actively fusing in its core at the moment, but that fusion is helium fusion by the triple alpha to carbon and on to oxygen. So um, it sort of all ties together. That makes sense. And uh, that's why with these different evolutionary stages, the temperatures seem to be slightly the wrong way round. You would think a more massive star might be hotter, but it's because it's progressed so far around the loop. Now, uh, another interesting thing with this pair of stars is that they are giving off vast amounts of X-rays, 10,000 times more X-rays than the sun does. It was first detected back in the 60s with rocket flights going up above the atmosphere, carrying X-ray detectors, not into orbit, just high altitude rockets. And they were able to pick up that Capella is one of the 
strongest sources of x-rays from the sky. Um, when it says it's 10,000 times the power output of the sun, that would be if you stood at the same distance from it. Um, and clearly Capella is a heck of a lot further away than the sun. So actually the relative dose that our atmosphere receives um, is, is a different thing entirely. We get a lot more actual dose from the sun. But the interesting thing about x-rays is that they can tell you about the atoms that are present. The uh, x-rays are energetic enough to knock off the innermost electrons of atoms, and those are bound by a very characteristic amount of energy that allows you to measure in the x-ray spectrum, and you can find out what uh, elements are there. This is an extract of the x-ray spectrum from Capella in the image here. And this guy, Henry Moseley, figured out what's called Moseley's Law, looking at the x-ray spectra of the elements, and uh, you get this very, very nice straight line plot if you plot the square root of the frequency of the x-rays against Z, the atomic number of the element. And so if you see a, an, an emission line corresponding to um, uh, the uh, x-rays coming from the innermost shell, you can read it off on here and get the atomic number Z or how many protons there are in the nucleus that are controlling the orbit of that electron very, very easily. Um, and it's a very good way of determining that elements are present. So back to the story of Capella. Well, it's known as the goat star and uh, associated with Amalthea, who was the goat that uh, suckled Zeus in the, the story. And that's represented in the picture at the top there. But the astronomical picture usually shows the constellation of Auriga, as we have in the lower picture there, with him holding a goat and some kids. And the kids are really represented by the little tiny triangle of three stars that uh, you can see just below Capella in the sky. It's quite a test of just how clear the sky is and how much light pollution there is and so forth. But uh, if we look at them on the map, you can see the star map on the left there where Capella is the bright star in the constellation of Auriga. And the three little stars there, uh, just to the lower right of it, those are the kids. And something very weird happens with the one labelled with the Greek letter E, the Epsilon Aurigi star, the tip of the three of the triangle of the kids there. Every 27 years, it dims down by a whole magnitude for a period of around two years. Um, and we've got the light curve picked up in, when it was last observed, 2009 to 2011 here. So you can see the green band dropping and then staying low for a couple of years and then coming back up. But it's quite lumpy, um, and that's not all down to experimental error and just difficulties with observations. There was actually a citizen science project where thousands of people got together to make observations during that last uh, transit event. And it is believed to be the transit, the passing between us and the main primary star of an object. Um, but there were a lot of different guesses about what this was. It could have been a swarm of comets or a giant planet or all sorts of other things. But the length of time of the eclipse and the slightly bumpy nature of it suggest that whatever it is, is not entirely solid. And the favourite candidate for this is the planet forming disk around a companion star. So you have the primary star, very bright because it's uh, swollen up to be another of these yellow giant stars and uh, giving off something like 80,000 times the amount of light that the sun does. It's, uh, it's a huge uh, glowing mass, many times the size of the sun, nearly as big as the Earth's orbit. But then going around it is a lesser companion that's actually too faint for us to detect directly, which is in the process of forming a planetary system out of a large cloud of gas and dust that's orbiting around it. And that gas cloud is so thick that as it passes in front of the main star, as the 
companion star goes about its 27 year long orbit it's blocking the light from the main uh, path and dimming down our view of the uh, brightness and we're pretty sure that this is what's going on because infrared telescopes have now been able to have a look and detect the heat signature of this warmed dust that's warmed by the star that's embedded within it. Now, the other very interesting thing that uh, I came across in looking at Capella was the fact that we have a direct image of the pair of stars, and this is it. These are actual direct images of the two large yellow giant stars that are orbiting around each other, just the distance of Neptune apart. And when you, uh, Neptune, Venus apart. And when you consider how far away these are, uh, this is incredibly high resolution. Now, it was taken in 1995 by the Coast Telescope. And the Coast Telescope is the Cambridge Optical Aperture Synthesis Telescope. And this is it. It's actually a, a very good example of a sort of mad scientist's underground lair. You've got this bunker on the old munitions site south of Cambridge, where some of the old radio telescopes are seen in the background there. And inside the bunker, there's this dimly lit lab with all of these amazing uh, railway lines laid out on it and lots of mirrors and lasers firing around. Uh, uh, it's quite an incredible sight to go and have a look at. And I've been fortunate enough to do that a few times. Then out of the front of the bunker on the right hand picture, you can see the white pipes. There are four of them. And those are light pipes that go out to a set of mirrors. And you can see one of the distant mirrors in the background in what looks like a set of beehives. Um, that is a, um, mirror arrangement there are four of them and one of the pipes goes to each they each have a collecting mirror about half a meter in diameter but they can be as far as a hundred meters apart and what coast does is collects the light sends it in down those light pipes into the underground uh, bunker where the temperature is controlled very carefully being underground helps with that and it's able to bring the four different tracks together and bring the images not only together but into phase with each other so that the light travel distance from Capella or whatever we happen to be pointing at is equalized for the four separate mirrors, even though they're physically not connected to each other. And what this does is it gives the effect of a single optical telescope in terms of angular resolution with a mirror a hundred meters across um, whereas in fact there are just the four half meter mirrors and uh, that that enormous resolution you don't have the brightness of a, a hundred meter mirror but you do have the resolution because of the, the size provided you can reliably keep everything in phase when combining the light so that the light signals don't start cancelling each other out. And it, it does that and uh, literally has little moving um, mirrors mounted on loudspeakers, which are vibrated by a computer that is measuring the light path length um, and trying to bring them into phase the whole time. And it's able to produce that absolutely stunningly uh, high resolution image, not just of the two stars as points, but actually of the surface of the stars taking up several pixels. I think they're about eight pixels each on the image, um, which is the sort of thing that gets me very excited. Um, and with that, I'll bring this one to an end. So thanks very much for listening. That was Once Around the Star, Capella, the Goat Star. <laughs>